Parenting is a challenging endeavor, probably the most important work on the planet. Raising godly children, uh, of course, is fully dependent on God's blessing, but it requires diligence on the part of the parent. And uh, this is so true in raising your children. Uh, to do a good job, there needs to be a parent, two parents, who are constantly on their toes, always being diligent, never really taking a break or a vacation from watching, training, disciplining, caring for, guiding. It's a 24-7 endeavor. And those of you who have been parents or who are parents know this. It is such a difficult task. Jesus experienced similar things in training and preparing his disciples to take over the ministry that would change the world. He really was parenting the twelve, in a way. Even the retreats that Jesus took with his disciples regularly turned into ministry opportunities. In fact, the feeding of the 5,000 was supposed to be a ministry retreat. It was supposed to be a time away from the crowds, if you remember. But here it is, once again, turning into ministry. Hard work. But Jesus continued to maintain diligence in training his disciples. Uh, he, he wanted to keep his disciples focused. Um, that was an ongoing requisite of his ministry. As Jesus was heading into the second half of his earthly ministry, uh, it was imperative that his 12 apostles were clear on two things. One, his true identity, and two, the purpose for which he came. This is what Jesus focused on incessantly throughout his three years with these young men. His identity and his purpose. Why did he come and who is he? So up to this point, about 16 or 18 months into Jesus' ministry, they weren't really settled on either of those questions. They weren't really clear on his identity, although Peter already made his great declaration. Um, but for the most part, they weren't real clear on his identity and certainly not his purpose. They really didn't understand his purpose until after the resurrection, if you recall. It wasn't until then that they had a handle on it. But they did know that Jesus was unusual. He wasn't the typical rabbi. He was unique in so many ways. By the time they reached Judea here in the future of Mark's gospel, um, for the second half of his ministry, they were starting to understand, in part at least, that Jesus was God in human flesh. They weren't completely clear on the ultimate purpose yet, but at least they had that half of the equation beginning to settle in their hearts. There are two things in this passage and literally throughout all of Jesus' ministry that he had to constantly watch out for, constantly pay attention to in the training of his disciples. Two things that he paid attention to. One was dangerous distractions that would undermine the progress of his disciples and secondly, the misunderstanding of his identity and purpose. Things that would distract them from his training of them, his communication to them, and then their misunderstanding of his identity and purpose. This passage deals with both of those things. First of all, let's look at the dangerous distractions that Jesus wanted to avoid. We see this in verses 45 through 47. For some reason, Jesus made his disciples, it says, immediately get into the boat and leave. So Jesus was left by himself with this massive crowd. The crowd that was left behind was ecstatic from being miraculously fed, and Jesus was concerned that the twelve might get swept up in the euphoria of the moment. And so he ordered his disciples into the boat and out to sea and off to the next location. John records that after the feeding of the 5,000, the crowd wanted to come and make Jesus king by force. Remember reading that in John? What this guy's doing is really important, making food for us, raising the dead. Let's make him our king. That makes sense, right? 
This is what John recorded. So Jesus, what did he do? He, he didn't want his disciples wrapped up in that fervor. And so he dismissed them. He gets them in the boat, sends them across the sea so they wouldn't be swayed by these things. Notice that it said in verse 45, he made his disciples get into the boat. Um, he made them leave. This, this gives the impression that Jesus had an urgency and applied pressure to his disciples to leave immediately. Immediately, he made them get into the boat, it says. Um, it seems that the 12 were reluctant to leave, as we would be. Well, I want to hang around and be a part of this. This is something that, this is really cool what's happening here. Look at everybody thinks we're awesome. We're part of this Jesus thing, and everybody's eating, they're full. It's exciting. Why can't we stay, Jesus? Uh, but he rounded them up, put them in the boat, and maybe even gave the boat a shove off into the sea to keep them from being influenced by these things. This was, in fact, a dangerous distraction. Why would it have been dangerous that these people, these 12 particularly, stayed with the crowd? Well, they would have followed the rest of the crowd into dangerous areas. Jesus had just spoken, if you remember, or taught on the bread from heaven. Mark doesn't record that teaching, but John does, Luke does, um, but not, not Mark. Mark had other uh, folks, just here that we'll get to in a second, but Jesus had just taught on what it meant to be the bread from heaven, that the bread that satisfies, the bread that fills, the bread that saves, if you'll eat his flesh and drink his blood. And so, he was teaching on the purpose for which he came. I, I came for this purpose. And the Passover was just about to happen, we've learned. Uh, and, of course, we know that the Passover was a Jewish feast that taught the very same things from an Old Testament perspective. So Jesus is trying to communicate the purpose for which he came. The crowd and his 12 disciples totally missed it. In fact, most of the crowd were offended by it. And that's when Jesus asked them if they wanted to leave also, the twelve. And Peter said, no, to whom shall we go? So, so Jesus was, was trying to avert a dangerous distraction. The first distraction, or the first thing, was a false view of Jesus. A false view of Jesus is dangerous. Particularly this twelve, this group of twelve, after experiencing the powers of Jesus, the crowds were growing increasingly convinced that Jesus would make a good Messiah. Put yourself in their shoes. They were under the tyranny of Rome. They had been under that oppression for quite some time. Here comes a guy that can raise the dead. Think of armies. He can raise the dead and he can feed them. Makes a good Messiah, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and they thought this. They were a sharp group. But their misunderstanding, of course, of the Messiah, the concept of the Messiah, was flawed. They thought the Messiah would come to restore Israel to world prominence by overthrowing Rome. But Jesus wasn't a political Messiah. He made this clear from day one. I think one of the ways to understand this passage is by looking at verse 52 with me, if you would. Jesus sent them off. <clears throat> And all this was going on, every, the excitement of the moment, the departure, the, the, the storm. They were, they were afraid, it says in verse 52, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Why would Mark insert this odd statement? The reason they were afraid, the reason all this was going down, because they didn't understand the loaves. What's there to understand about Jesus feeding people? Some, some things that are important. They, they, they didn't grasp the teaching recorded in John 6. I am the bread of life. They didn't grasp that. They, they, they didn't understand what that meant, to eat your flesh and drink your blood. No wonder everybody's leaving Jesus. You're saying stuff like that. Well, what did the loaves mean? What's the bread from heaven? They weren't clear on Jesus' identity and purpose. Another possible misunderstanding was over the number. Why did Mark include five loaves and two fish? Why were there 12 baskets left over? 
And as we've learned over time, there's never words wasted. Everything has significance, including numbers used. Why five and two? Why 12? Well, there are scholars who believe that the numbers that Mark records had specific significance. The five loaves represented the five books of Moses, the law of Moses. Jesus associated himself with the law of Moses, Genesis through Deuteronomy. The two fish represented the two tablets of God's law given to Moses and the Ten Commandments, five and two. So you're looking at verse 52, five and two, five books of Moses, two tablets of commandments represented in the person of Jesus Christ, presented to the people. And he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus came to fulfill the law and provide for the masses what they could not provide for themselves. Fulfillment of God's law. He could not only, he not only rather obeyed the law perfectly, that is Jesus, which God required, he fulfilled the requirement of a perfect sacrifice. These things revealed in the law of Moses. He fulfilled the requirement of everything. G obeying God's law, providing for sin. The 12 backs that's left over, of course, would then represent the overabundance of provision in Christ and his righteousness. Romans 5, where sin abounds, what? Grace abounds all the more. This is something that is the nature of Christ. Abundance, superabundance. Grace upon grace. And so misunderstanding the lows meant that they still hadn't fully understood the identity of Christ or why he came. They didn't understand that he was fully God in human flesh, come to earth to take on our humanity that he might die for the sins of his people. They didn't get it. So Jesus sent them away from the danger of those who wanted, in their misunderstanding, in their ignorance, to make Jesus king. We also can, we, in this room, this, this morning, can also have false and dangerous views of Jesus, as did his disciples and the crowd. We can get wrapped up in things about Jesus that aren't true. Let me give you a couple examples. Doctrinal errors, for example, that Jesus wasn't really God. He was a good man, a good teacher, a good leader, but not really God. You can see where that would lead. Uh, you, you wouldn't have to necessarily obey a good teacher or follow a good man. But if he's God, those options disappear, don't they? Yeah. And yet, we have quite a high percentage of the population saying, good man, but not God. Next, we could say he's not really a man. This was a particular doctrinal error in the early, er, uh, early times. Uh, they say he was just a replica of a man, but not really one of us. How could he be? And then we could say, doctrinally, he really doesn't care about me personally. He cares about us generally, but not me particularly. These are, these are dangerous doctrinal errors. We also have some dangerous practical errors that we might encounter regularly. One, that Jesus, God, is really here to run errands for me. I'm not his servant, he's my servant. And we could even find ourselves praying in those terms. He's here to fulfill my wants. He's, you've heard it said, he's thought to be a celestial Santa Claus of sorts. He's maybe more interested in my obedience than me personally. So what do I do if I'm a legalist? I'll, I'll perform better to get the favor of God. I, I just have to perform. If I check the list, if I do the things, Jesus will like me more. He'll accept me more. Dangerous error. Or another, on the other side of that same equation, one would be legalism. The opposite side of that is antinomianism. He's not too concerned with my obedience in minor areas. He really doesn't care if I'm completely honest, completely moral, com completely faithful. Dangerous error. And so Jesus, as with his disciples, desires us to not be distracted 
by dangerous error. If we're going to be a disciple of Christ, fully committed to Christ, we cannot afford to be drawn away by dangerous error. False views of Jesus are dangerous. Next, false views of obedience are dangerous. False views of obedience are dangerous. When the disciples reluctantly got into the boat to leave the scene of the feeding of 5,000, they were being obedient, weren't they? I mean, these were full-grown men. They could have said, Jesus, mind your own business. I'm going to stay here and eat a little bit more. I'm going to party with the rest of the crowd. I'll leave when I want to. I mean, who are you to tell me what to do? Could have been an attitude, maybe ours. I'm sure that they wanted to stay, but Mark emphasized the firmness of Jesus' instruction. Get in the boat. And so they did, and then he pushed it off. But not long after they got into the boat, around 8 or 9 o'clock at night, according to, you know, the time frame, what happened? They got into a storm. Another storm. And so their obedience got them into a pickle. If they had stayed on the shore, they wouldn't have been in the storm. They would have been sitting around a nice warm fireplace someplace, maybe a campfire even. Not in a storm. But they found themselves once again in trouble on the Sea of Galilee, but this time because they had been obedient. They had obeyed Jesus. They had gotten in the boat, rowed off to Bethsaida, and turned out became very uncomfortable because of their obedience. Think about how many times obedience has caused discomfort. Corey Ten Boom, obedience cost her family their lives and years in a concentration camp. Jim Elliott cost him his life, cost his family a father and a husband. Fellow missionaries John Patton, Hudson Taylor, all paid the price of obedience. Discomfort, multiple levels. Maybe, maybe you have seen little trouble or discomfort because of your obedience, your faithfulness to Christ. Obedience may cause discomfort. Honesty may cause you to pay more in taxes. Diligence at work may cause you to be despised. Being moral will cause you to be ridiculed in worldly environments. Obedience causes discomfort. So when you commit yourself to Jesus, you expose yourself to many things that those who aren't committed will never endure. Obedience will lead to difficulty, discomfort. <laughs> but unfortunately, there's false opinion out there that suggests that's not true. They say that if we'll follow Jesus, all will go smoothly. Just come to Jesus and everything gets better. We've heard these things, right? Listen to a TV preacher just for 10 minutes and you'll hear it. <clears throat> if things aren't going smoothly, then evidently you're not following Jesus or not living by faith. This is untrue and dangerous, and Jesus wants us to avoid it. He wants his disciples to avoid it. Obedience will bring trials, will bring storms at sea, but it will also bring joy. I want you to see how this story proceeds. This obedience, even though it brought difficulty, discomfort, brought joy and ultimately worship. There's a part of this story here that's interesting, this particular part. But most important is what the disciples did once Jesus solved their chaos. What did they do? Matthew records that the disciples worshipped in that moment, quote, quoting Matthew, truly, you were the Son of God. They had learned, at least in this moment, to trust that Jesus was the God of heaven. They were growing, at least. They worshiped in that moment. So, stepping back from all four Gospels, obedience will often lead to challenging circumstances, which will lead to help from God, three, which will lead to worship. Obedience will lead to challenging circumstances 
then help from God in those circumstances, and then your response of worship and gratitude and joy. Let me share it with you two verses from Psalm 50 that kind of sum this up real neatly. Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15. Offer sacrifice of thanksgiving. Why? Well, because God has, you have been obedient to God. And then he says, perform your vows to the Most High. Call upon me because your obedience has led to trouble. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. And three, you will glorify me. You'll worship me. Obedience, what's it do? Leads to discomfort. Discomfort leads to God's help. God's help leads to worship. Every time. The point of the Christian life is worship, isn't it? Would it be hard to argue that from Scripture, that the point of the Christian life is worship? How about this? The point of all creation is worship. The trees clap their hands. The rivers sing. The mountains praise. And if they could, the rocks cry out. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, Paul told the Corinthians. So as you faithfully navigate the chaos in your life, it will result in worship. You'll see Jesus more clearly, which is why you worship. Your heart will be drawn more and more deeply into a passionate worship of him. And then worship, of course, will start the process all over again where you learn to be more obedient, take deeper risk for the cause of Christ, and deeper levels of commitment, producing more discomfort and more joy in worship. It's an ongoing cycle in the Christian life. In the midst of our trials, we may be tempted to think that Jesus really doesn't know about our situation or care about my personal struggles and pain. Have you been there? Are you there that maybe Jesus doesn't know what's happening in your life? Seems that this story tells that the opposite is true. Verse 48, we read that Jesus did see the struggles of the men rowing out in a stormy sea, and he went to help. The story will help those who are in the middle of a storm right now in your life. That even though you're in the middle of the dark, windy time, very uncomfortable, even if it's because of your obedience, Jesus sees it. And he will help you who are experiencing chaos. What a wonderful encouragement this story is to us who are in the middle of it. Jesus came at the darkest part of the night when the disciples spent, had spent all their energy trying to row against the wind and probably greatly discouraged at this moment if we had just stayed at the shore. I knew Jesus was wrong on this one, you know. But then he comes to them with help. And this is usually when Jesus comes, isn't it? He never comes at the beginning of a trial because there's lessons in the trial, right? In the whole trial. He usually comes towards the end of the trial, but he comes. Remember that God is the God of 1159 and 59 seconds. False views of Jesus, false views of obedience are dangerous and need to be avoided. Not just for the 12, for all of us. Next, the second thing that Jesus wanted besides avoiding these dangerous positions is remembering who Jesus is. Remembering who Jesus is, verses 48 through 56. Coming to them in the storm, he reveals himself. Arriving at the shore and beginning to love and heal people reveals things to us about Jesus. This particular section of scripture recorded in all the gospels that include Jesus walking on the water contains a boatload, to use the pun, of many miracles. This miracle of walking on water was preceded by feeding of tens of thousands of people. Jesus saw the struggling disciples in the dark on a stormy night from three miles away. 
miracle. He walked on water, miracle. He gave Peter the power to walk on water, miracle. Immediately upon entering the boat, we read in other gospels that the wind stops, the waves stopped, and in fact, the boat was automatically, immediately transported to their destination. And then upon arrival, he resumes healing people of their diseases. All this compressed in this short narrative. Why all these miracles? Why such a compression of intense, miraculous workings of God? Because it's critical to remember who Jesus is. That's why. We must avoid dangerous distractions and we must remember who Jesus is. Listen, if you were on the dock that day when just prior to Jesus calming the storm, so Jesus walks on the water to the boat, he gets in the boat, and voila, they're at the shore instantaneously. What if you had been fishing on that dock? All of a sudden, in front of you, a boat full of 13 guys with eyes that big around. Well, 12 with eyes that big around and one regular. <laughs> Might have been a surprising event, right? So Matthew's the one who records that as soon as Jesus got into the boat, the storm stopped and they were transported to their location. Talk about whiplash. Notice that Jesus didn't arrive in the disciples' distress until it was late. 11.59 and 59 seconds. He wanted them to battle before Jesus showed up with relief, but, but nothing obstructed the arrival of Jesus. Nothing obstructs Jesus' entry into our chaos. He will arrive, it's just a matter of when. It says he meant to pass them by. Why? Why would Jesus want to pass by? Well, there's a couple different translations, but I'm going to point out what we can learn from this particular translation. Meaning to pass them by to help. It wasn't until they saw him that they cried out, Hey, we're in trouble here. Sometimes I think Jesus allows us to continue in our struggle, in our chaos, to help us remember who he is and why he came. He desires to draw you to himself in worship. Because it's in that drawing where we are filled and satisfied with the bread of life. But what we see here, as we look to, to the, the, the text, remembering who Jesus is, what we first see is that Jesus is Lord of the storms. Lord of storms. Uh, if you've been in church any length of time, you know this one thing, whether or not you've identified it this way or not, I don't know, but God controls the weather. Have you figured that out yet in reading your Bible? This is his department. When weather changes, it's because of God. When seas part, it's because of God. When storms stop, it's because of God. Jesus is Lord of the storm. Remember who he is, Christian friend. God has always ruled the weather, and what, so what we can deduce here is that controlling weather is a sure sign of deity, right? <laughs> Jesus is doing it again here in a matter of a couple days. This intense focus of miraculous events in the minds of the disciples so that they would know who he was without a doubt because they were soon going to be facing the world without him, remember, in 18 short months. And so if there's one thing that Jesus wanted them to know was that he is God and he even controls the weather. The weather is something that controls us. We don't control it, right? Um, we in the Yakima Valley with our farmers who depend on agreeable weather for their livelihood know this better than most. If we have warm weather, we'll go on a hike, we say. If we get snow, then I'll go skiing. If it rains, we can avoid forest fires. If it's too hot, we'll turn up our AC. If it's too cold, we'll turn up the heat and pay bills. And on and on it goes. Not with Jesus. 
he says to the wind and rain, that's enough. That's, that's it. Time to stop. Deity in front of the disciples. This was, like I said, the second time within a few days that Jesus pulled this off. It wasn't until after the resurrection, of course, though, that they really were settled on the purpose. Why did he come? Jesus' lordship of the weather in this story actually began before he sent the 12 away across the Sea of Galilee. At the time, he knew the storm would give him an opportunity once again to teach them to establish his identity uh, with his disciples. It says, after sending the, the, away the disciples and dismissing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain overlooking the Sea of Galilee to pray, but from that vantage point, even if it weren't miraculous, he could see three miles. I live about three miles from a Tannum Ridge, and I can see vehicles on a Tannum Ridge, especially at night. They have their headlights on. I don't think the boat had headlights, but um, if it were a clear night, who knows what Jesus could have seen naturally. Either way, even if it was a miracle, either way we can see the, the loving care of Jesus for the crisis of the disciples. <clears throat> there are two options, though, that I, that I want to mention to you about this vision of Jesus from the hilltop, and that is what I just mentioned. It could have been a clear night that he could see three miles, or it was supernatural vision. Either way, it's, it demonstrates his loving care. So he, he has a purpose in all that he does, sending the disciples away at the time he did, knowing a storm was coming, uh, going up on the mountain to pray, seeing his disciples in distress, going to them in their storm, in their crisis and their chaos, um, all had purpose. I want you to look at verse 48 f for a moment. He says, and he saw that they were making headway painfully, <clears throat> for the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by. It says he, he meant to pass by. I said, there's a second translation. It is this, he desired to come alongside. So one translation would say he meant to pass by, and in the original language it would be easy to, to translate it the other way, he meant to come alongside. Pass by, come alongside are very similar words. Um, and so we see that here. Jesus knew their location, he knew their plight, he wanted to come to their aid. We see the heart of Christ for his people once again. <clears throat> they were fatigued, growing all night. Jesus walks up beside the boat. Would that startle you? Yeah, which is why they cried out. And so Jesus' deity was on display once again, and it scared the disciples. Of course, that fear didn't last long, right? Remember what Jesus said? Take courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. And in this, in this comforting word that he gave them, he used the self-title of God. In the original language, it says, Ego and me. That's the same language that God used at the burning bush with Moses. Ego and me. In Septuagint, we read that. But every time Jesus wants to reveal his deity, he calls himself that. I am. Moses asks God, who should I say sent, them, sent me? And God said to Moses in the burning bush, tell them I am sent you. This is what Jesus said to the twelve. I am. Take courage. Don't be afraid. The creator of the waves, the creator of the wind, the creator of the rain is in the boat. It's going to be okay. What a great encouragement to these twelve guys. As you can imagine, the twelve are on a steep learning curve. <laughs> when it came to understanding the, the identity of Jesus and the purpose for which he came. But he came as he taught in John 6 when he was handing out this bread from heaven. Uh, he, he came to offer himself as the bread of heaven, the bread of life, the eternal food, which we all need to experience his forgiveness, without which there is no forgiveness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. He came to rescue people. He came to bring abundant life. The king of the universe came to be one of us and save us, rescue us. 
At this point in Matthew's account, chapter 14 of Matthew, Peter gets involved, and you can always count on Peter to get involved, right? And what's Peter do in the account of Matthew? We all remember this. Lord, if that's you, <laughs> bid me come on the water. You can't fault the guy for his bravado, I guess. I'm not sure what it would be called. But he, he ends up jumping out of the boat and walking on the water out to Jesus, and we know how that worked out. Um, but Mark got his information from Peter. The reason that Mark knows about these things is because his, his, the senior pastor in his church in Rome was Peter. And so Peter made sure that Mark didn't include that in his gospel. He goes, two things. I don't want to take credit for being only the second man on the planet to walk on water, nor to be famous for my failure. <laughs> Although he didn't get away from that second part. But anyway, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained, I guess we could say, when he jumped out of the boat. But Jesus saved Peter from drowning in that moment in spite of Peter's doubts. There, there was a beautiful picture here in this story, the way he graciously helps us in our need. The, the 12, Peter reaching out his hand in our weakness, in our lack of faith, and resolving, rescuing, encouraging, saving all the time, things we've all experienced in following Christ. John 6, 21 records that as soon as Jesus stepped in the boat, it was at its desired location. Wow, I don't, know, I don't know how Peter could have left that out, but he did. John recorded that. It says that they were utterly astounded. He got that part right. Um, they were, verse 51, utterly astounded. On which account? There was like eight miracles in less than 24 hours, utterly astounded. So Jesus is the Lord of storms. Next we see Jesus is the Lord of compassion. So it says, Mark says that they landed at Gennesaret. But notice in verse 45, he sent them to Bethsaida. <laughs> Go to Bethsaida, they docked in Gennesaret. And they docked in Genesaret because Jesus wanted them to dock in Genesaret. He was the one who transported the boat. So what we're seeing here, what Mark is telling us, what they, all Gospels tell us is they were heading for Bethsaida, but they went to Genesaret. Why? They had been blown off course by the wind. But that wasn't the only reason. There were people suffering in Genesaret that needed a healing, loving touch from the Savior. And so in his mercy, he took that boat that he had voiced direction to Bethsaida, and he himself sent it to Genesaret so that he could have compassion on these people who were suffering. We've got a good Savior, don't we? <laughs> he wanted to show his disciples that he cares about people. Their physical, physical suffering matters. But it, it matters just so much as that it leads them to a Savior who saves from sin. It, his physical healing intended to relieve their immediate physical suffering because he loves people, but was also, and more importantly, to help them see that he's able and interested in healing their spiritual suffering. He is a compassionate God, a compassionate Savior. Not just Lord of the storm, but a loving, kind, gentle, compassionate Savior. Not only transcendent above all creation, but eminent in a boat, wet with his disciples, suffering cold and hunger, meeting people's needs at every turn. We have a compassionate God. Paul picked up on this compassion. He says, along with other locations, he says in Colossians 3.12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. You want to be like Jesus? Show compassion. 
Have mercy. Meet people's needs. Being conformed to the image of Christ begins with becoming a compassionate person. Not a callous person, not a they deserved it, they had it coming person. A compassionate person, Paul says. Kindness, humility, meekness, patient, compassionate hearts. Sounds like Philippians 2, doesn't it? Friends, we are to be conformed to the character of Christ by being like him. Jesus needed to constantly remind his disciples, like our parents need to constantly remind their children of truth. Jesus reminded the disciples of his deity and the purpose of his coming to earth regularly. And this is a standout example. Jesus is God and he came with a compassionate heart to rescue people. Are we compassionate people? Am I compassionate? Friends, we must avoid dangerous distractions and remember who Jesus really is and why he came. Pray with me. Lord, we are so thankful that you are who you are. Lord of all creation, Lord of the storm, and yet Lord of compassion. A merciful God who does not treat us as our sins deserve. Lord, I pray that you would grant us spiritual growth as your people. That we would become more like Christ the longer we follow him. That we would see Jesus in truth that his character would be imprinted on our hearts and minds and holy spirit that you would transform us into that image blessed god i thank you for coming to earth revealing yourself to us providing a way being our savior and friend in the person of jesus christ filling our every need all the way through life. And I pray this in his name. Amen.